All right, so good morning. I am Michelle, Michelle Allison, class of 1964. This is my first reunion ever, 55 years away from the college. It's been quite, a, quite an experience. I've already been deemed the most beautiful babe of my class. <laughs> An honor I accept with com complete lack of humility. <laughs> so um, I don't know what people are expecting. I've obviously talked to a few people here and there. This is not the story, fascinating though it is, of my tr personal transition, although I have too much ego to keep myself out of this. But I tried to make this general uh, and of interest to everyone uh, because I thought that was just a, a useful thing to be doing. Um, I have two identities that are important to this presentation. One is, is my gender, and the other is um, the fact I'm a psychotherapist. So that means I approach everything from a kind of um, psychologically minded point of view. I'm interested in motivations. I'm interested in what makes people tick. I'm also interested in um, repair and restoration, uh, connection, that kind of stuff. So when I talk about sociological or political topics, I talk with a slightly different voice. I'm much less confrontational. Uh, I'm looking for things to get resolved in a positive way. Tell all my clients, my goal for you in this initial interview, so to speak, is that you have a really good experience. So that's my goal for you all as well. So the title, uh, I didn't reprint the Arthur Miller reference. Arthur Miller wrote a play in 1955. It's called A View from the Bridge. The bridge is the Brooklyn Bridge because it's about uh, Italian immigrants in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn. Um, it isn't terribly relevant to this discussion. I just like the idea of a bridge, which I feel I am on. And uh, you have a view from that bridge, which I have. But if you were to look at the play, it is kind of an interesting representation of uh, um, masculinity in the mid-50s, which has some things in common with what we have now. So we're going to start off with a little centering uh, exercise. All you have to do is uh, watch it. So this is a very well-known poem. It's an ancient poem from Afghanistan. Every mindfulness training offered in the Western world seems to have this as part of it. Um, but I think it's very good in terms of getting us in the right uh, mental state for what we're going to do. So I will begin with, this being human is a guest house, every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. OK, so this is the questions that Michelle Allison thinks about. I always like a third person reference while speaking. <laughs> You see that in public discourse, and I want to be part of that. The point is, these are things I think about. I don't assume that you think about them, but maybe you will. And uh, so question is, do we really know what we mean by sex and gender? Our language is interesting. We use words. I'll be talking with someone, and I go, do I really know what I'm saying? So I go look the word up. So we don't often know. We use these words thinking we know what we're talking about, but usually we're not quite on target. Second, is sex completely biological and gender a purely social construction? There's a debate in places where these debates happen about which is which. I have an opinion. What a surprise. How is gender politics shaping our faltering social cohesion? What are the prospects for America to become whole? This is a theme in a number of presentations in this uh, reunion, and what a surprise. So I look at it from um, my psychological, restorative point of view, but I'm very invested in that. Is there an essential nature or even a set of traits defining male and female so that we can generalize about male and female? And there will be generalizations in this talk. 
And if you hear a generalization and you go, wait a minute, that's not me. Here's the bell curve. Congratulations on being an outlier. Uh, but just bear in mind that there's a lot of variability. So I'm speaking in generalities with exceptions to be taken for granted. Are feminists right about the corrosive impact of patriarchy? Good question. We'll find out, at least what I think. <laughs> How are men faring emotionally? Does psychotherapy, what I do, have anything useful to offer men? Good question. Not a lot of men in the consulting room, more than there used to be. Um, is male fragility, something you've never heard of, but I'm very interested in, a valid or useful notion? Language to me needs to be useful. There's no, no truth is really less relevant than is this helpful to someone's self-understanding or moving the conversation along? And finally, the question that's so personal, <laughs> having experienced both genders, what have I personally learned about our gender lives that is clinically relevant? And the answer is, boy, I've learned a lot. <laughs> so th these are the definitions. Now, I said, do I need to talk about these, or does everyone know these and they're going to be so bored? But while I've been here, it's very clear to me that I do need to talk about these. And this one, number one, cisgender. Unless there's some trans person in the room, you are all cisgender. The gender that you experience and identify with is the gender you got assigned at birth when the doctors picked you up and said vagina, penis, and whatever. That makes you cisgender. And transgender is me, someone who, when they picked me up and said penis, but it just turned out not quite, not quite correct. And the trans community invented cisgender because we needed some way to refer to everyone else. Gender non-conforming, non-binary, gender queer, that's kind of a subset of gender variants. Uh, those are the people who use the they, them, their pronouns. Uh, they deny any kind of binary affiliation on either side. And we do believe that uh, gender is a very fluid and um, sort of um, on a spectrum. So these people say, I'm not male, I'm not female, and I think they're very courageous because they effectively invent their own gender without any templates. Whereas, you know, most of us, we just order it off Amazon. We open it up and put it on. <laughs> All right, queer. This is a reclaimed word. You are allowed to use it. You may refer to me as a queer person. Someone asked me last night. I think it was Ray. Are you, are you do yes. I mean, I'm kind of a Johnny come lately to the, to the queer world, but you know, I'm trans. I, I think I'm queer. Uh, I, you know, I'm not a queer. That would be totally uncool. But you can use that as an adjective if you wish. No, no, no requirement. Gender role expression. Now that's what this, that's what this is. The hair, the dress, uh, the jewelry, the shoes, cool pumps. It's a social expression of how I tend to portray my inner understanding, which is my gender identity. Last two are getting into a little more uh, sketchy territory. Intersectionality. This is Kimberly Crenshaw, 1990. It's a terrific idea describes the way that multiple systems of oppression interact in the lives of those with multiple marginalized identities. Okay, so when people say, how is your transition going? I say, it's going great, but bear in mind, I'm white. If I were a person of color, my transition would be fraught with anxiety and outright danger. We pretty much have a death of one transgender person of color, usually a trans woman, because they're, you know, sex workers and marginalized. I mean, I know 365 deaths a year is not uh, staggering, but it is kind of noteworthy. So intersectionality is where, is, you know, you sort of say, where are my marginal identities? I, and also, I'm female, and I don't know how the ladies here feel, but I think you can make a case that to some extent still, being female is a marginalized identity. So intersectionality is just a useful idea to keep in your mind. And then privilege are the unearned sources of social status, power and institutionalized advantage experienced by individual by virtue of their culturally valued and dominant social identities. And the 
important word is unearned. You get them just by being born who you are. And uh, when I was a child growing up in South Florida, I kept, and I used to read the World Book Encyclopedia and see all these maps of countries. And in those days, they were colonies, many of them. I kept thinking, geez, how did I get born in the US? And why am I not born in, you know, Swaziland or something or other? And I don't know the answer to that question, but there's a tremendous, it's worth remembering that when you're in a privileged position, it's just dumb luck that you're there. Okay, so there's been talk about tribalism and discrimination and so forth, and I'm gonna offer an explanation. It's not the only explanation, but I think it's a good one of how this works. And this has to do with being marked and unmarked. So groups who are dominant or the majority are typically viewed as unmarked, unremarkable. Their experience and perspectives are taken for granted deemed an unquestionable norm. They're implicit and in the background, they're invisible. Minority and marginalized groups become marked in comparison. They seem remarkable and tend to stand out. Do you think I stand out as trans? I think so. Oh, by the way, there's one feature of my presentation that is marked within being trans, and that is my voice. It's a male voice. Because you'll find out when we get to hormone treatment, you can take all the ushers in the world, it doesn't raise your pitch. For that, you need pitch elevation surgery. I would love to have that surgery. The post-op is a month of no talking. Could be torturous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the marked and marginalized groups are, uh, they tend to stand out. Uh, they garner undue attention and scrutiny. Scrutiny. They're also likely to be viewed as inherently questionable, suspicious, alien, exotic, abnormal, artificial, or deceptive. People who are marked are generally viewed as having something that unmarked people do not have, and this something is subsequently subjected to all sorts of comments, questions, critiques, debates, and double binds that the unmarked person escapes. Okay. Unmarked, marked distinction plays a role in all the isms, sexism, genderism, racism, ableism, all of them, where it provides the unmarked group with countless privileges they are typically unaware of due to their unmarked and therefore seemingly invisible nature. So that's from Julia, Julia Serrano, really terrific uh, trans theorist and great player of guitar. All right. <laughs> This, you've never seen and probably never will. This is very much part of the psychi uh, psychological, psychotherapeutic literature. This is so helpful for self-understanding. This is a grid, and we're talking about two dimensions. And the horizontal, the horizontal dimension is, you know, we have on one side boundaryless and the other side walled off. And uh, that sort of talks about your relationship style. Boundaryless people, I mean, they don't even know where they end and another person begins. Walled off people, uh, you may know them. I used to know one, it was me. Many, many walls and defenses. People are kept at a distance. What we want for good, healthy uh, self esteem is, whoops, back, wrong, there. We want some sort of sweet spot. You don't want to be absorbed into the other, but you don't want to be kind of so disconnected that um, it's a problem. Now, the one that, the one in the up and down, the vertical, the one that mat is the one that matters most to be today, and that's the shame grandiosity dynamic. And I defined those, went to the dictionary to get them because I want you to be very clear about what those are. So we're going to start with shame, an unpleasant self-conscious emotion typically associated with a negative evaluation of the self, and that has feelings of distress, exposure, mistrust, powerlessness, and worthlessness. And I think the most common example of shame is, you know, you're a kid and you've done something wrong and you get caught and you get the famous look and the tone of voice and the language of you screwed up, and depending on what kind of parent and attachment environment you're in, that could be a mild rebuke, it could be very destructive. 
Words matter to children. They take everything very seriously. But we all know what shame is, and I know what shame is because I have lived so many years in the land of shame. I speak the language, I know the culture, I even know the best restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> so shame and I are old friends. If you are a closeted transgender person for as many years as I have, you know what that shame feels like. So because shame is so uncomfortable, uh, it is our human tendency, according to this theory, to move out of shame to avoid the discomfort of being there, and then we move into grandiosity. And, and, and well, I'm just going to say this. You are going to know what I'm talking about, because how can you not? An unrealistic sense of superiority, a sustained view of oneself as superior to others that causes one to view others with disdain or, an, or as an inferior due to a variety of personal characteristics. Need I say more? <laughs> and by the way, since I'm not a psychiatrist, I have no problem diagnosing from afar. <laughs> and I am not diagnosing. I'm being a thoughtful social commentator. <laughs> OK. So I know that's kind of abstract, but there's a method to my madness. OK, now I'm going to take a little side journey into racism for two slides. Why am I doing that? Wait and see. So the most influential book I read this year was Robin DiAngelo, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. Every white person should be reading this book. If you've read it, feel free to reread it. Um, if you're not a white person, you can read it and see if she got it right. Because uh, I think she did, but I'm really not an authority on this. So um, Ms. D'Angelo's uh, thoughts are, she starts out just to remind us what racism is from kind of a scholarly point of view. An implicit ideology rationalizing racial hierarchies. And in this sense, whites are the norm or the standard for humans. People of color are a deviation. Remember, we were talking about marked and unmarked. Then she puts forward a terrific idea that I have run with and adapted to uh, my own work and the gender issue, white fragility. And this is the response of white people, often very nice, thoughtful, progressive, caring white people, um, when they are confronted with the idea that by virtue of being white, they are in fact still experiencing and participating in racism. So when white fragility is triggered, emotional disequilibrium occurs, and you get anger toward the trigger, and this leads people to say these kinds of things. You know, uh, I have to leave. This is too much for me. Uh, they become tearful and somewhat hysterical. Uh, they describe their experience as abusive, traumatic, or violent. And this actually showed up in bald view of everyone during the Michael Cohen hearing. So if you Google Cohen hearings, Mark Meadows, you will see Representative Meadows, a fine American, who is challenged by Rashida Tlaib, the Muslim Palestinian American representative from Detroit, who said, you know, when you bring this White House employee, a black person, out and stand them behind the committee, some people might think that's kind of a racist gesture. And Mr. Meadows flipped out. He went really ballistic. It's something to behold. He became tearful in near hysterics. How could he dare be accused of being a racist? And the effect of this was to completely deflect everybody away from the action to his emotional distress. He had the chairman of the committee, Elijah Cummings, who's a very you know, influential black legislator, trying to soothe him. He had Representative Tlaib saying, no, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I was just kind of talking in general. So that's the kind of interesting example of white fragility. It's, and what it does is it, it makes the white person who's upset the center of the conversation, and the issue gets derailed. And you see a lot of that. OK, so she has pages of these typical white responses to conversations about race. I have a few select ones. 
I'm a good person with good intentions, therefore I can't be a racist. You're playing the race card. I'm being misunderstood. I'm not feeling safe, meaning I'm not feeling comfortable. The tone of this conversation is wrong, too personally challenging, and there needs to be trust for feedback to occur, meaning I need you to trust that I am not a racist before we can discuss my racism. <laughs> This is such a wonderful book, really. <laughs> so um, the central tasks for white people, according to this book, are develop racial stamina. And please note that. And you could put emotional stamina where you put racial. In other words, if you are fragile and cannot tolerate this kind of uncomfortable discussion, then you need to get a little more emotional resilience dare I say, spine or backbone, something that, you know, is allegedly a very masculine trait. Mm -hmm. White people need to grapple with how racist ideology and socialization shapes our responses when we are challenged about racism. racism. They need to overcome their reluctance to acknowledge our racial advantage. They need to stop seeing themselves as individuals who are exempt from the forces of racial socialization and implicit bias. Give up the binary that good equals non-racist and bad equals racist. This is part of our dualistic Western thinking, you know, dark and light, good and evil. It's really not helpful. Don't use colorblind and color celebrate narratives. Um, a color celebrate is along the lines of, I value black people, I have friends and family who are of color, I admire and impress by many black people. That's the color celebrate, and it's a kind of way to fudge the issue. And then, uh, and then the, um, the color blind is, uh, I don't see color. So I was meeting my ex-wife, and by the way, I have great, she's one of the best people I know, and I'm meeting her new boyfriend, a very nice guy, and uh, he's got to deal with many members of her family, including me, and we're talking, and at one point he says to me, you know, I don't see, uh, a, I, I don't see a woman, I just see a person. And because I want to be nice to him, and he is a good person, I don't say anything, but secretly I'm going, really? I want you to see me as a woman. I want to be recognized for who I am rather than having you be gender blind about me. Okay, so this is something that uh, is in the book uh, and, I, and it's her way, the author's way of talking about what kind of response uh, a thoughtful white person might do if you are interested in gaining more awareness about your racial attitudes, and, uh, and I think it's so good, so I, I've reprinted it here, I'm gonna read it. There is no face to save and the game is up. I know I have blind spots and unconscious investments in the status quo. I did not set up this system, but it does unfairly benefit me. I do use it to my advantage and I am responsible for interrupting it. I need to work hard to change my role in the system, but I can't do it alone. Therefore, I am grateful for when others help me. I don't become defensive, I am grateful. Thank you. Feedback from others is the key to recognize and repair our inevitable and often unaware collusion. How, when, and where you give me feedback is irrelevant. It is feedback I want and feedback I need. Understanding that it is hard for you to give I will take it any way I can get it. It doesn't have to be sugar-coated. It just has to be real and deeply felt. For my position of social, cultural, and institutional power, I am perfectly safe and I can handle it. If I cannot handle it, that it's on me to build up my emotional stamina, whether it's my white stamina, my gender stamina, whatever it is. And really, we can do this. All right, so in, 19, in 2018, the APA, which for the, our discussion is the American Psychological Association, and by the way, I'm not a psychologist, and I don't even play one on television, um, it, it delivered one of its uh, guidelines for treatment, and this one was for men and boys, and it's long and kind of like what sort of thing psychologists write, I hope, no, yeah, no offense, you know how they are. Uh, <laughs> um, and it, one of the, so I just excerpted a little bit. So um, 
It defined traditional masculinity as emotional stoicism, homophobia, not showing vulnerability, self-reliance, and competitiveness, which leads to the disproportion of males involved in aggression and violence as a means to resolve interpersonal conflict as well as substance abuse, incarceration, and early mortality. Probably doesn't apply to too many of us uh, Amherst College grads, but if you take it in a broad sense, there's a case to be made and those fairly generic, you've seen them kind of statistics will show that. And uh, those are the sort of stats that you see them and you go, well, whatever. You just, they don't really register, but they are kind of shocking. Uh, these are men that maybe you do or don't know. I see some of them in my office and in my practice. Uh, but, you know, this does go on. There was, in fact, a remarkable un and not unexpected pushback between, whoops, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, to this from the right, uh, saying that it uh, kind of ignores the essential nature of men and boys, that it uh, turns the problem upside down, that it punishes men for being men, and that men's essential nature um, is, you know, is worthy. And I'm not going to argue that, there are, that, that men are worthy. Um, Question is, do I have time? I'm going to do this. So the very nice article by David French in the National Review, uh, and uh, he said the important thing is we want men to be grown men. We want them to be physically and mentally tough, to be able to rise to a physical challenge, show leadership under stress, and exhibit self-control. So the leadership under stress, he viewed that as a deeply felt need, and. Uh, and that exhibiting self-control was, you know, a, another way of looking at being stoic. Uh, in other words, you need to control your, your um, uh, un uncomfortable impulses. Um, I would like to have a discussion with uh, Mr. French, because I think I could find common ground. But how do you have a discussion these days? OK, so now here's where it gets maybe a little edgy. So Bell Hooks is an African-American sociologist. She's been around. She's written a lot of books. I like her stuff because she talks about men's capacity to love and the need for them to become a more emotionally fleshed out. She does, on the other hand, have this kind of in-your-face feminist critique of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. <laughs> Just to get our attention. <laughs> But she follows up by saying, both males and females are socialized into the system. Men are not the enemy. And that the underlying principles of patriarchy are domination, separation, and control. There's a value for you know, self-control and, and devaluing emotionality. Patriarchy socializes men to deny their feelings, dooming them to emotional numbness. What I want to say here is, um, notice the word deny. It doesn't say men are not emotional. Men are clearly highly emotional. But it's the question of whether it's socially permissible or comfortable to express in the way that, say, women are able to do it. I mean, if I get tearful up here, no one's going to accuse me of being unmanly. I mean, 10 years ago they might have, but now I'm, I'm, I'm home free. Um, <laughs> Social power is awarded, to conf is awarded to those who conform to masculine norms. And you see this. How masculine do you need to be to run for any political office? I mean, zoning office of appeals, it's not too demanding. As you go up the scale, you must be a pillar of strength. You must be, you know, project uh, a particular view of leadership and power. And that's who our politicians are. And when we have political debates, we debate around the edges. Well, is that person quite, is Joe Biden a little too soft? And, and the women, they really have to figure it out because how can you portray strength? I mean, Angela Merkel seems to be able to do it. Uh, but I don't know what our problem is here. But uh, in the recent polls, the women are down in the middle, although Elizabeth is apparently on the rise. Um, here's the most interesting uh, two quotes I really like a lot. The desire for power precludes the formation of loving, healthy relationships. To know love, you must let go of the will to dominate. In marriage therapy, one of the rules for not having a successful marriage is demanding to be right. Do not demand to be right. 
And here's, what, and here's the real uplifting thing for, for the men in our audience. Any time a male dares to transgress patriarchal boundaries in order to love, the lives of women or children are changed for the better. And since we know that even among traditional male thinking, the protection and care and raising of your children is a primary interest. So you see we're not really so dramatically far apart on this. All right, so Bell Hooks proposes feminist, feminist masculinity. Um, we're going to give up the dominator model. We're going to get rid of having everything be a power struggle. We're going to move away from male models that do not require the construction of the other as the enemy. We always wonder, where does this need for an other come from? Maybe this is one of the answers. Rather than assuming that men are born with a will to aggress, this new culture would assume men are born with a will to connect. Strength needs to be redefined. This is me. What do we mean by strength? I talked about emotional resiliency, ability to uh, take criticism, ability to be called out when you need to, ability to stand up and say, yes, I, uh, I, ma I made a mistake, and, and, and rebound. So we can do this. It's not that big a stretch. And the final thigh is, idea is that men become more real, more authentic, through the act of connecting with others. And that seems kind of uh, obvious, but seemingly needing to be uh, repeated. Uh, all right, now we're going to go into the trans world. And here, this is probably a bit new. So I left, in my initial definitions, I left off sex and gender because I don't think those words are so obvious. The typical definition of sex is referring to the biological, and they mean typically genetic chromosomal aspects of being male or female. That is nature, or sometimes how God wanted it. Uh, gender, well, but if you can be secular, you can have a secular version of nature. And gender is totally socially constructed. It's the psychological, social, and cultural experiences of males and females. And that's a very popular idea among feminists, uh, among, you know, uh, more progressive and radical thinkers. Unfortunately, it's not going to help us. So here's a couple of outcomes of this sex is purely biological. The first was a resolution in the Republican House that says you know, sex and gender can, cannot mean gender identity. Uh, they just have to refer to your genetics, your chromosomes. And then their HHS floated a uh, very famous in the trans world uh, directive. And uh, on, uh, what's the date? May 24th, it became official policy. Congratulations. A uniform definition of gender is determined on a biological basis that is clear, grounded in science, good luck, objective, and, administ ad and administratable. <laughs> it's like... We always talk about the gender police in the bathrooms. But you know, this will be this will be done. You'll be held up, your genitals will be reviewed, they will be putting it down, and that birth certificate will not be changed. Uh, my home state of Ohio is still not changing the gender marker on birth certificates. God love them, Ohio. Why oh why oh why oh why did I ever leave Ohio? Uh, <laughs> So proposed definition defines sex as either male or female based on immutable, and immutable is great, biological traits, unchangeable, determined by the genitals that a person is born with. And I don't know what this means because who knows how far it'll go, but I think the immediate goal is to undermine the Obama Title IX uh, directives, which you know allowed for a lot of um, institutions receiving federal money uh, I assume the gender-inclusive, complete solitary bath, complete with a shower that they gave me in Cohan. I don't know whether that would still be allowed under this, but it's not a happy circumstance. Um, that's what happens when you have these rigid, unsophisticated knowledge, uh, definitions of sex and gender. So I'm going to argue. All right. So sex is purely biological. No. Gender is purely a social construction. No. Sex is a collection of sexually dimorphic traits that are variable. Even the chromosomes are variable. We have a small number of people who are intersex, and they have very odd uh, chromosome analogies. And uh, even with that, you have you know, genetic uh, anomalies. So it is not this absolute uh, 
uh, circumstance. In the intersect population, I can't take too much time, but I will just tell you, to fulfill my trigger warning that I will discuss genital anatomy, anatomy in a professional way, that doctors would see an intersex kid where they would have, you know, some kind of small penis, maybe a, a, a vagina, and they'd go, well, this is not going to be helpful. Why don't we just remove this kid's penis, you know, at age, you know, two hours, uh, and save them a lot of trouble. So there's that. And then when we come to, uh, to trans people, we do change our sexual traits through cross-gender hormones and gender-affirming surgeries. I mean, people say I look great. Estrogen is, is part of it. Estrogen is part of it. Um, female and male are umbrella terms describing groupings of people who generally, generally share many of the same traits, but with considerable variability and exceptions. For example, sex differentiation, you know, the, genet the genitalia part, occur happens in utero early, but there is a separate place where your gender identity lives in the brain, and that happens later. The brain is sexual and variable. Transgender people have brain structures midway between cis male and cis female brains, according to some kind of provisional research. But there is, it's clear that gender identity has a neural dimension and exists on a spectrum. All right, so in recognition of the fact that the gender identity, which is your sense of what your gender is, is biologically based, uh, we actually have diagnoses, medical diagnoses of this condition. And the ICD-10, it's uh, incongruence, gender incongruence. And in the DSM, it's gender dysphoria. And if I write a letter saying so-and-so has gender dysphoria and they'd like HRT or they'd like a top surgery and put my credential and my license on there, an insurance company would go, okay. So that's why this is terribly important. And the details of it are you dislike or are uncomfortable with your primary, secondary sex characteristics. You like to be rid of some of them. That's why people have surgeries to remove uh, and sometimes to replace. And uh, you want to have the, and you want to have the characteristics of the gender that you experience. And and of course, for many people who have a strong desire to be treated and to live and accepted as a person of the experienced gender. And the question here is: Can you trust people to know what their gender is? And the answer is yes. There is no better authority on my gender than me. Likewise, there's no better authority than your gender than you. It's a very excellent opinion. Uh, <laughs> I was talking with someone last night about this. Your gender, your gender identity is not actually an opinion, it, which is kind of a higher function. This is in the most, it's right down near the brain stem in parts of the midbrain that are exceptionally primitive. It is felt. You don't think it, you feel it. And then you think about it after as a way of trying to communicate to yourself and to anybody else who's interested what the hell is going on. But you feel it. And everybody who, who feels it, kind of, that's the first thing you do. You go, this feels like something. And then you struggle to find language. And if, you know, like me, you know, realizing this in, when I'm 12 years old in 1954, well, I didn't have a lot of things to work with. Nowadays, as we know, there's, there's role models and public discussion and so forth. OK, so that's kind of what you need to know. So when the, when the parent's 14-year-old kid comes to them and says, you know, pretty sure I'm a boy. Why don't you call me Cameron and he, his pronouns? They go, you know, adolescent brain, turmoil of adolescence. That can't be true. It's possible it might not be true. We would, I would be interviewing that kid, and we'd be watching that kid for a couple, three years. But if by the time 16, they were still, still you know, firmly believing that, and, and usually these kids are very credible when I see them. Yeah, we let them, we let them begin a medical transition. Uh, it's moved down. It used to be had to be 18, but now endocrinologists, if they're pretty confident of the identity, they're, they're, um, they're giving hormones at 16. But parents freak out about that. 
Speaking of hormones, let's talk hormones. So <laughs> you all have them. Uh, they're part of your nature. If you have ovaries, you have estrogen. And if you have testicles, uh, or balls as they say, you have T. Testosterone in the, in, the, in the trans world is T. It's just too, we're too lazy to pronounce testosterone. <laughs> So uh, on the left side, this is what you get from estrogen, more or less, more or less. Uh, decreased muscle mass and strength. So as I'm feeling not as strong as I used to be, I go, is it because I'm 77? Or do I have a T level of seven, you know, which is like virtually nothing. Uh, body fat re redistribution, I'm waiting for this part to be distributed anywhere but here. <laughs> Softening of the skin, yes. God, I put my hand on my thigh to, I don't know, look for a tick, and I said, this feels really nice. <laughs> Breast growth, some, not a lot, especially when you're older. Best medical silicone you can buy. Um, body hair diminishing, doesn't go away totally. Facial hair tougher, a bad Three and a half year, three and a, two and a half years of electrolysis and going strong. If, you, if you're bald, you'll stop being bald. And if you were going to be bald, you won't get bald because male pattern baldness is totally linked to testosterone. Uh, and your male sexuality, um, this is from WPATH. The male sexuality is suppressed, but it's replaced by your female sexuality. So it makes it sound like you become a eunuch. And that's not really it. Uh, I mean, you would be a eunuch if you took if if you do if you took no, if in other words, if you have no sex hormones, then you're then you then you're kind of fully castrated, and that's what certain uh, sexual pedophiles plead for. Could I please have an orchiectomy? Um, but for some reason, we we can execute them, but we can't give them an orchiectomy. Uh, go figure. On the on the trans male side, uh, this is what you get from T. Uh, and you don't have to suppress the estrogen. The T just walks right over. It's a very powerful uh, compound. So facial and body hair growth, and this is what most of the trans guys are so invested in. How, why, you know, and I keep telling them, when you're a kid, you know, your beard takes a while to come in, be patient. But some people have heavier beards than others. Um, if they're, you know, genetically going to have hair loss, they'll have it. By the way, I did not know this, but a trans male client of mine explained to me there is a a male hairline with the widow's peak, uh, and then there's a female hairline that's straight across. And I said, you learn something every day. Uh, voice drop for, for, uh, for trans males. Increased muscle mass, yes. They go work out, and they start to look quite muscular, even if they're five foot two. Um, body fat distribution, I guess. I don't really you know, know a lot about that. Cessation of menses, very important. Most trans dudes, when, they are, when they have their periods, that's one of the first times they realize, I'm not really sure this is going the way I would like. And that, and that experience is different from a cis female's response, which is certainly, you know, it is a response, but it has a different tonality. Um, the clitoris becomes enlarged and the vagina atrophies. Got it? So that's HRT. Hormone treatment. Cis people get it all the time. Low T, you take it. You know, mo you know, women take, uh, you know, birth control to regulate their estrogen. Uh, all of this kind of stuff goes on. This is not a monstrous Frankenstein-like treatment, uh, despite what some people may think. All right. So this is this is just a conceit. Uh, this is your presenter. There I am in 1964. There I am in 1972 with my flinty gender dysphoric gaze. It's at my daughter's high school graduation. And there I am today. OK, this slide was the most fun putting together. And I'm just going to blow through it. <laughs> OK, well, this is about if you're marked as trans, what do cis people, not everyone, people at my reunion have been so great. I've been totally wonderful here. But in some other circles, this is what might be said to me or uh, my brothers and sisters. Not a real woman or man, freak, weirdo, fag, tranny, she-male, confused, abnormal, emotionally, <coughs> mentally unstable. 
unwitting pawn, recruit of the transgender cabal, attention-seeking, exhibitionistic, narcissistic, selfish, reckless, naive, an impersonator, a fake, deceptive, a trap. I just got to talk about a trap. That is a trope. I love that phrase. It's a trope from uh, the adult film industry. There's a whole industry called shemale porn, which is despised by the trans community. This is made for cis men who are excited by chicks with dicks. And uh, that's just kind of what goes on. So a, a trap is, you know, in this scenario, you see a beautiful woman, it's all great, and then, you know, when she undresses, she has a penis, and you have been trapped, and the idea is you've been trapped into committing a homosexual act, which is the most shameful thing you could possibly do. So bizarre. So bizarre. <laughs> But it goes on in the world that we tend to ignore. All right, getting back to my list, fetishistic, don't worry about, auto, worry about the word autogynophilia. That's just a crazy word someone made up. But it's the idea that we're fetishists, and I thought I, was, I had a fetish too. So uh, perverted, promiscuous in general, or just want to have sex with guys and girls. Transgender is not a real gender. Gender itself is a fiction. Only the male-female binary is real unnatural, ungodly, satanic, my favorite, oh my goodness. <laughs> Always wanted to be a member of the army of Satan and now I am. <laughs> my little trident, you know, on my tail, so cool. Uh, having an agenda, and probably not a very nice one, playing the identity card, engaging in identity politics, that's an interesting thing too where you are, if you're a candidate uh, of the democratic liberal persuasion, the debate is, should we waste our precious political capital on identity politics because it could be deadly uh, in the next election? And identity politics, politics broadly, but there's only 1.4 identified trans people. And uh, so, you know, that doesn't seem like a lot. In fact, I keep wondering, what are people getting so uh, excited about? And we're so tiny. Um, Engaging in special pleading, it's the idea that we're kind of asking for something special, like could you just use the right pronouns and not have us go into bathrooms where people look at us and think we're weird. Um, influenced by social contagion, this has to do with uh, teenagers who go online and you know they kind of connect their own gender dysphoric experience with the broader culture and there's a social contagion. It turns out it was in, you know, invented by two people in New Jersey and got floated on the internet. And you know, there's a big article about it in the Atlantic last summer. Um, and finally, just being misgendered, using your dead name and the wrong pronouns or being called sir. Like, how are you doing today, sir? I'm standing here like this. I mean, I'm not saying I'm passable, but really, if you see me like this, could you just sort of call me ma'am? All right, now we're going to move in the cycle, into the psychological literature. And this is, uh, this is kind of the psychological version of what patriarchy, patriarchy gives us. And we talked, I talked earlier about how it's a kind of separation style of thinking. So we have, you know, the, the masculine uh, traits are the ones we know, and then the lower ones are the feminine traits. And we've kind of divided those up. And so we have these kind of split off, rather reduced in, in, in texture sort of versions of ourselves. So that's a piece of it. Um, there's the power over relationship model, a, another version of the zero sum thinking, the idea. And you see this in all of our politics. There's only so much to go around. Anything someone else gets, we lose. You will not replace us. There's only so many seats at the table. And if a Jew or a black person or a queer takes a white supremacist seat at the table, that's the end of the world. That kind of thinking. And um, you see this in, in male behaviors. I exhibited so many of these things. Lashing out, withdrawal. I wasn't violent. Um, and I did abuse substances, although not outrageously. And then finally, an important one when you talk about our, our lack of ecological awareness, the hubris of viewing ourselves as above our surroundings rather than as part of them. And this whole idea that nature is here to be utilized slash exploited is, I think, um, a feature of patriarchy. Okay, three models of intimate partner relations. This, I think, 
will be interesting. You guys mostly are married or had relationships. Unconscious relationship says that the person you pick, even though you have all these good reasons, and they are good reasons, that there's another set of reasons, unconscious, having to do with some unresolved stuff from your childhood because nothing gets nailed down completely. And so you pick a partner who has some of the features of what you experienced as a kid, but is a much better version. And the hope is that with them, it's all going to work out. Second one is a model based on adult attachment. It's my big favorite. Why do people pair off? And the answer is it's mammalian. It's baked in at the most fundamental levels of our being. We like to be close to another warm body. It's just kind of very comforting. So that, the paradigm for that is the parent-child relationship. Um, and as an adult, you'd like to kind of enter into a voluntary relationship which replicates that sense of security and, and care. And the goal in, a rela in an adult relationship is secure attachment, knowing that your partner will be there for you emotionally when you need them. And that's why everybody needs to develop the capacity to be emotionally available because it makes it work so much better. And finally, this is important because I think this is very reflective of where we are culturally. Um, one of the writers that I'm influenced by talks about 20th century husbands, 21st century wives. So um, women are now very much uh, invested in seeking more than just kind of the role as mother and caretaker. They want intimacy at the sexual, intellectual, and above all emotional levels. So women are not going to give in and back off most of the time. And for men, appeasement and hoping it'll go away is not going to work, <laughs> unless you get really lucky. Um, well, I have women in my practice, and they're all thinking about, am I going to divorce this person? And I say, if you can drag them in here, I think we can probably work with something. And I try and caution them not to do this too quickly. But I mean, you know, I can understand their points of view. So. Under this new and revised way of being intimate, which we're all going to practice as soon as we leave, the golden rule of relationship empowerment is, what can I give you that will help me get what I want? And I think that's good, and if you can, that would be fine, but I'm going for the gold. I'm asking for an, um, a way of looking at things that says, Cultivation, well, I'll get to the next slide. Let's finish with the last piece is Gottman, big researcher, most reliable predictor of long-term marital success. It's not better communication. It's wives communicating clearly their needs and husbands altering their behavior, including their attitudes to meet those needs. Best predictor. Gottman can bring someone into a lab, give them a little task, to videotape them for 20 minutes and predict whether their marriage will end in five years 85% of the time. <laughs> Scary shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm ending with saying that the primary obstacle to change, as I see it, for men is this notion of male fragility. So to the gentleman in the audience, uh, would you be willing to consider what part of your identity have you chosen and what part has been given to you? Um, will you seek a more authentic version of you? If the version of you is fine, then there's no obligation. It's just a question. The questioning of male privilege seems to some men like a terrifying loss of their core identity. So this means the driving force is not a, a hatred of women, or an, but really the insecurity and interior kind of soft selfhood, which I call male fragility. So when we talked about the shame and grandiosity, when, you feel, when, a, when a person feels shameful, try and stay within the shame place. Acknowledge that lashing out, withdrawal, and avoidance, which are used to manage difficult emotions like shame, depression, anxiety, fear, and disappointment, it's a short-term gain. They always come back to bite you in the butt. Um, and this is mindfulness thinking. Stay with the immediate experience. Do not run out the door and do not go off on some you know, uh, uh, narrative that takes you away from, from what's actually happening. Develop distress tolerance. 
you can handle this if you practice and train yourself. So this leads to my earlier idea of a more robust idea of strength, one that's more useful, more long-term. You know, it will benefit us all. With increasing emotional resilience, seek emotional connection through the cultivation, and this is my piece, the cultivation of a loving and generous heart. This is the idea that if you love someone, you want to graciously give to them the gifts that you have, whatever they might be. Uh, so the earlier definition of how can I help you get me what I want, it's kind of transactional, and I don't think it's a bad way to go, but I like this more kind of, kind of Christian-like. It's that agape stuff from the New Testament. Agape is Greek for love, as opposed to eros. And uh, that's what I'm promoting with my couples and my male clients. Think about being selfless. If you have a strong sexual urge, think about not acting on that in some clumsy, intrusive way and sort of thinking more about what does your partner need from you. Most of the wives that we have are awfully long-suffering. They're awfully terrific people. Don't they deserve the best we have to offer them? And finally, um, focus on, same thing, focus on graciously. And gracious means without resentment, without uh, holding back, without being bitter and pissed off. Oh, yeah, she, I caved, you know, I got henpecked. I had, no, it's graciously giving. You feel great when you do it. The giving part is what makes it worthwhile. Uh, and what you give them is emotional support, kindness, compassion, and sexual pleasure. You give them sexual pleasure. Please, think about it. Learn their anatomy. Listen to what they have to tell you. They'll really appreciate it, and you will have so much more rewarding sex, really. Okay, so I'm going to reprise our initial slide. Let's see what it means now. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, as you did today. Even if there are a crowd of sorrows, even if you heard things that made you a little uncomfortable, who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, meaning you know your current thinking and, and conceptions, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, said and highlight that going in, but the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful, because being grateful is a wonderful thing to cultivate. Be grateful for whoever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And it's been my deep honor to be your guide in our joint enterprise of clearing you out for what I hope will be a new delight. Thank you so much for allowing me to address that. I'm going to use this. You're going to talk loud. Um, how are traditional women's colleges handling the non-binary world? Geez, I don't really know. I, uh, I uh, was talking with, who was I talking with who had gone to Mount Holyoke? Yes. Let, 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 let's, uh, let, let, you should answer that. Well, Mount Holyoke is, you know, it, it welcomes trans people of all kinds. And it certainly has changed. I think that we article, I think it was in the Clockwell Higher Education, is Mount Holyoke still a single-sex institution? Because nah. it, it, yeah, you had all these trans dudes, you know, yeah, came, exactly. in as, came in as women, and, and now so, what are we? <laughs> I think we've decided we, we are what we are, and we're, we're happy about it. I mean, it, it's, 
seems to work. It's very different from when I graduated, but it's, I, I think they're doing, doing a good job of it. <clears throat> Others? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I, oh, uh, I don't know whether you talked about this at the beginning, but I, I'm curious about your personal story because in 2012, you were. Yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, ongoing in my, uh, my very in, in, uh, successful male impersonation. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this transition, I'm kind of, uh, I have this upside down life. I married at 38 in a desperate effort to prove my malehood and normalcy. I uh, had a terrific 30-year uh, marriage, two wonderful children. Uh, got divorced for a variety of reasons. Gender dysphoria is in the background, but wasn't totally it. Uh, kind of got outed when my daughter was home from college and was rooting around looking for a gift bag for a Christmas gift. Said, what the hell is this stuff? And uh, I bless her for nailing me. And uh, so that was uh, December 2015. So I'm a pretty newly minted uh, woman. What about during college? Well, you know, the way this works is that, remember, I have no clue. It's not like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm secretly trans. I'm, I just don't know what I am at all. So in college, um, and I've talked about this, I, was, I had a great time in Amherst. I had a very repressed high school life. And, uh, you know, I dated, and uh, I still wonder what happened to that terrific girl from Mount Holyoke who played the viola. Uh, and um, so it would come and go. In other words, it would, if I was occupied, uh, you know, it would sort of stay in the background, and other times it would make its appearance. Uh, it's a very, gender dysphoria is a very devious uh, kind of experience because you, you particularly just don't, can't predict it. But no, I think anyone who remembers me, it's been a long time, will say, I, I look like you know, any other sort of Amherst student. But did you have homosexual relationships? No, I know. I was, I've never had homosexual relationships. Yeah, I guess I never, I didn't, I'm not, you know, difference between orientation. So gender is how you experience yourself in an interior fashion. And orientation is who you love, who you're involved with romantically. So I've always been interested in women. Uh, I'm still interested in women. Um, and um, other than, you know, in, for a while I was a ballroom dancer and I danced with guys. That was about as, but I actually did view just to be able to dance with guys as an exercise in overcoming my latent homophobia. Um, toward guys, of course. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Blockers for adolescents. Um, yes, she wants to know um, if a, if a child identifies as trans early enough, prior to what they call Tanner stage two, then they can put on be put on a pubertal blocker, which will delay the onset of you know puberty, um, so that should they continue to want to transition, they do not have to undergo the dramatic kinds of, you know, reconstruction and reversal that it requires. You know, I got to tell you that as a trans person, of course, you know, it depends on the individual. When I sit with, with kids, they're so persuasive, really. I sit with them, you know, eight, ten sessions. I, I don't think they're, they're, they're off base. But a part of me is a little anxious about it. But if it's, if it's reversible, in other words, if you put a kid on blockers and then it's 16 when they would go on HRT, at that point they're saying yes, 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 then I think it can work. There's a lot of stuff in the media about things being done to very young children. And this is bullshit. This is just political stuff or you know, stuff being generated. I mean, the internet is so crazy, really. Uh, and this craziness plays out there just like everything else does. But as a parent, I mean, I've actually, my kids are straight as hell, cis as hell, but I've thought about what my, my, my kid comes to me and uh, tells me they're trans. I go, I don't think it would be nothing. Uh, you know, we're all human. It's more complicated sometimes than you think. I, I try and respect everyone's feelings about this, and I, I do appreciate that. Uh, parental love is 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 you know often powerful, but yeah, I think that's 
I mean, my provider, Middlesex uh, Hospital in Connecticut, is actively moving in that direction. Uh, the S Connecticut, uh, Central Connecticut Children's Hospital has been doing it for some years. Um, it probably needs to happen. Probably needs to happen. The, actually, the gentleman in front of the lady over there, are you still talking, Hugh? Yeah, I just wanted to ask the uh, classmates, has uh, Michelle's personality changed, <laughs> or was this always the way Michelle was? Classmates. You're, you're very above it, so I'm just curious. <laughs> so, what do you all think? <laughs> I think so. And everyone who knows me says that I'm way brighter and warmer and more outgoing. Because what goes on when you have gender dysphoria, particularly if you're of my generation, is it's a lifelong uh, defensive action. I mean, you talk, I mean I, I, you know, I've spent more energy than Trump will ever spend on building walls. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so you really, I mean, wh the question of why am I here at Reunion 55? And the answer is, I, could, I, then I, I always said, well, I won't have a successful life to compare to all my very successful classmates. I won't know anybody. I had all these kind of surface things. But the real reason I, now I realize I couldn't come back was I just couldn't come back without feeling who I, knowing who I was. I remember that as soon as the transition happened, I said, right, there'll be a reunion. I forgot when the date was. So when Ray sent me the letter, I go, oh, great, now I'm going back. And I had a few anxieties about coming back just because whatever. Although rationally, I knew it's going to be great, and it has been. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm totally different. Dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria, okay? You have, you have gender euphoria now after you address your gender dysphoria, I guess is the way it works. <laughs> so, Not for you specifically, but in general, is there a continuum of people who change and then regret that and want to go back? Oh, uh, yes, the famous detransition issue. Uh, there, who knows what the, how accurate the research is. WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, which is the closest thing we have to anything that is in any way scientific or knowledgeable, uh, their data says 1% to 2% detransition. And that means that, you know, despite the therapy and the letters and everyone's best efforts, some people get it wrong. And... Um, you know, I, I can live with that. I can live with even a slightly, I mean, I'm going to live with whatever it is. It's not going to change because of what I think. It's very, very small, though, uh, because it's not a whim of the moment for most people. And even the people who detransition, there was a, a, a person on the Internet, and they, they went into HRT at 17, and they had top surgery at 22. And then they're you know, on there telling you, I hate this. So, go figure. Uh, how about you? So you indicated that the percentage of trans individuals in society is relatively small. That's what they claim, 1.4 million. And even if you double that, it's still tiny. It, it sounds small. So given that, do you think that there's a disproportionate amount of attention paid in the media to the trans process and movement? And if you agree with that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, well, I'm interested in how impactful the transgender experience is. And my theory is it touches something that is important. I think our gender identity is something we don't think about, but when a trans person shows up, you do think about it. And of course, I like that, because I, that's what the whole talk today was, to say it's not about me, although certainly somewhat about me, but it's about you all too. Um, yeah, I, it's... Um, Probably any publicity is better than no publicity. Um, but, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. It's just kind of the way it goes. But, you know, this is a culture that is not very comfortable with anything involving sexuality. And let's face it, transsexualism is, 
has a strong sexual dimension. We can talk about how gender not being sex, but you know, it's, it's surgeries, it's you know, vaginoplasty and phalloplasty and chest top surgery and hormones. I mean, it's pretty dramatic. So I think it captures people's, I think it strikes a, a tender place in people. Somebody else? Sure. So, and then you up there, if you can just re I'll try to remember. Uh, on the subject of racial pre prejudice, we talked about earlier. Um, I know that, like most white people, I picked up a certain amount of racial prejudice and profiling in my childhood. And while my attitudes are okay, I guess, um, I know that the unconscious tendency or preconscious tendency to profile is still there. What can I do about this? Um, go read White Fragility to start with. It'll, it'll really, it'll change your thinking. It changed my thinking. I thought I was a, ah, I'm, I'm not some card, card. That's the problem. If you're a, a Charlottesville marching white supremacist, it's all easy. The, <laughs> I mean, uh, those are, you know, they're the Satanists. But for the rest of us who are just kind of schlumping along, trying to figure it out, it's way more complicated, isn't it? I would really, that book is, that is the book, that's the Bible for us white people around race to start with. There's other good ones. Tanahishi Coates, if you can handle him. Uh, I mean, I'm on board with reparations. I don't know what they should be, but I'm a believer. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm part of enslaving people, and I feel horrible about it, really. And you back there? Can I push us further on trans kids and blockers? You know, and also on, like, when kids are developing a gender identity? Do you want to do it, or do you want me to? Yeah, you go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, I'm a bio major here, and a master's in bio at Smith, and I've been teaching middle school science for the last eight years. You know, I have a bunch of trans kids. Um, <laughs> hormone blockers, well, you know, the first thing is that a bunch of, um, almost all, a whole bunch of studies have done in a whole bunch of different ways that are measuring when do people first develop their gender identity, both cis people and trans, and it shows somewhere in the ballpark between one and a half to five or six-ish, you know, maybe a little bit later, but generally like at a very young age, and that most, not all trans narratives would say that people knew when they were a young person, but that, you know, plenty would say that they knew something, or maybe it was, you know, put, um, pushed to the side or repressed in various ways. Um, and also that, you know, things also tend to, you know, that plenty of kids will say something when they're little. You know, plenty also then have to deal with a bunch of dysphoria around puberty and have to push around that. Um, and I would, the way I like to frame it when I'm talking to parents and students is that puberty is a choice. You know, blockers have been used since the 1980s to delay puberty for people who um, had what was deemed to be early onset puberty, you know, and basically have no real long, basically just delay it for several years and have been shown to have basically no long-term, you know, side effects, or no long-term bad side effects in, a whole, in most studies. You know, there have not been a lot of long-term cohort studies on trans kids who've had blockers, but there are a bunch in process right now. Um, and that basically I would argue that there are like, they're life-saving, you know, in a whole bunch of ways. They give, they, basically give kids extra time to think, they give ex kids extra time to go to therapy, they give all sorts of ways to prevent lifelong body changes that they will then deal with in every interaction with people for the rest of their lives. You know, it is, access to them feels vital and feels like it would save all these kids all sorts of problems and complications long term in the future. Um, there's also a piece there where you know, it is a scary thing for parents, but it, it is also a thing that, there's a difference between a social transition where you are being treated differently, you know, which oftentimes is happening as a little kid, a medic, you know, blockers, which are just a delaying action, and a medical transition where, you know, Michelle was talking about in terms of like hormone therapy. And then if you're really no further, a surgical transition, which are all the other pieces on top of that. You know, and that I would argue that when, when in doubt, it is better to give the kids the blockers and give them more time and give them some chance to think about it and be able to decide rather than have an irreversible, you know, body changes that happen to them. So I think that's a really great, uh, great argument. And you did, and you're, I mean, you could see I have some mild ambivalence, and you don't have any, and that's great. So uh, thank you for that. You know, I, I've just seen enough kids do it. No, I also realize uh, that in a school as we are creating more space. No, it's your, I, you, 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 I found you very persuasive. Yeah, you know, and that there's a lot higher, like in a place, in a world where we're creating more safe spaces, you know, there might be a higher percentage than that you know, 0.6 Williams Institute number that you're throwing I mean, you'd, I have seen people try and claim that, the, you know, that it's a bad idea, that there's some fallout around it. But, you know, there's, I don't know. I, I agree. I think uh, 
it, it's it probably I'm you made a believer out of me. Thank you. I'm curious about the college today. What are they doing in terms of mental health in general, uh, sexual orientation? That, uh, the, Anybody from the, the men college and women? Here? I can't. I totally cannot speak for the college. I had a conversation yesterday with the head of institutional research here at Amherst. Uh, who said that uh, there's an epidemic of mental health issues uh, and 30 to 40 percent of the kids coming into Amherst are exhibiting diagnosable mental health issues. Could you repeat that? Wow. Wow. 30 to 40 percent of the kids coming into school are, are facing mental health issues, according to the head of uh, Amherst Institutional Research. That's, that's a broader trend across colleges. Yeah, 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 yeah I, don't mean, I don't mean to say that it's the same trend. Yeah. Amherst yeah. specifically, sorry. But, but a lot of that is depression. Oh yeah, that's got nothing to do. That's got nothing to do. Yeah, and they they're really grappling with it, and they they don't have a, a complete answer yet. Right, and I'm I'm you know I'm you know ten minutes from UConn, and it's endemic, and uh, you know my daughter had it while she was in school a little bit, and uh, it's. There you're looking at, I feel my quick theory on that is we have, at, we have problems the way we structure adolescence in this culture. And uh, so as a result, the leap to college is just often, um, I mean, it's, it's a critical time. Most of your really serious mental health conditions blossom 18 to 23, 24. It's just when your thought disorders, bipolar, stuff like that. Um, kids have more trauma. There's a lot more trauma, and that starts to show up. So a lot of things are in play. But no, um, there's a, it's, a big, it's a big deal. I think one of the most interesting points you made, at least to me, was that there's a physical chemistry in the brain that's different for people who are trans in the midbrain and the brain stem. Uh, when somebody says they think they're trans, are they tested? Is it testable? No, it's really based on a personal testimony, so to speak. But it's the idea of what would, I mean, you rule out, do they have a thought disorder? In other words, are they oriented? Do they, you know, are they living in some sort of, you know, strange schizophrenic fantasy world? Never seen that. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just in the same way you can't test for ADHD, and yet if you talk to a person with ADHD and ask them the right questions, you'll go, yeah, yeah, it all falls into place. So it, but it's the idea that we are each our own best authority, if you, and if you ask the right questions and give people an opportunity to speak and listen with any degree of care, I, I, you know, I don't have, you know, some trans version of gaydar, you know, it's like they walk in the room. But, you know, when they start to speak with me, I, I recognize what they're saying. Um, and and even, even the non-trans therapists who do this, and that's pretty much everybody, uh, so there's one other, two or a couple other people in Connecticut who are trans who do this work. And we all, we all acknowledge, yeah, you, you, you hear it and they, they're very convincing. Because they're really just bearing witness to their interior experience. But no, it's like a lot of mental health diagnoses. I mean, you can, you can have someone come in and they seem pretty depressed. Then you give, a, give them the Beck Depression Inventory, which is a very well-known uh, paper and pencil test. And, you know, they come out hardly depressed at all. But they act and feel depressed. So, you know, that's kind of the way I look at it. Feel any tension between, for instance, like the intersex movement and the transgender movement, uh, and especially as we we consider, you know, the non non-binary moving toward a more non-binary understanding of gender, the relaxing of the social understanding of gender. Do you think we'll start to see more people doing what you know you consider transitioning from male to female or less? Like, where do you see all those things kind of playing together? Well, I mean, it's I mean. It feels to me as though that um, it's way more permissible to be trans. There's modeling, there's information, there's education. And these ki kids are online, they're looking at resources, they're figuring it out, they're talking to, to you know, people online. Uh, there's a, you know, the mental health community is much more thoughtful, there's lots of training there. So, you know, it, it's uh, why there's more, I, I, it's gonna continue, I mean, everyone who, feels trans should, you know, act on it is my attitude. And, and why they feel trans, I really don't even, to me it's just part of uh, 
part of biological variability um, unfolding developmentally. In other words, there's certain pathways um, in utero in a couple of months after you're born where things consolidate around uh, you know, the neural basis for your gender identity. And so that's, you know, is that, so that happens and then what people do with it is up to them. I always tell people, you, you do have gender dysphoria and what you do with it is totally up to you. If you want to transition, you can have it. If you want a mini transition, uh, you know, a lot of older, you know, settled in their lives people, they kind of go transition light. Maybe they take a light hormone dose, do some private guilt-free cross-dressing, often with their wives, and uh, that's all they do. You know, they're not going to come out at work. They're not going to rock the boat. It's too dramatic. Um, I mean, doing what I do is kind of crazy. Um, not to me, but, well, actually to me. I would go, Are you kidding me? I'm actually doing this? Uh, let me get, let me get. Uh, Were you a psychotherapist long before the change? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And not a particularly wonderful one, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> too judgmental, too black and white, too arrogant. Yeah, that's, that would be my, my, my thought. A genetic component there can you actually do studies about what whether if the parents have let's say oh genetics I, I I mean I'm not I'm not a I'm not a biologist or a geneticist but it's it, it the the thinking now is that it's not genetic okay. uh, that there's no gene for it and um, I re, I, I've never seen anything other than that other than that. Um, Uh, you now see children, younger and younger, and their open conversation to be who they want to be. And, and, and it's open on the internet. But as we sit here, we're harder nuts to crack because we weren't allowed to have those feelings. And, and it took years for you, as you say it. Yeah. But, but to my daughter's generation, her friends were very easily becoming who they wanted to be in middle school. And now, I think, and, and now we have younger parents with younger children, and I'm hoping that it's a more open subject uh, so that the old people, you know, who yeah. weren't raised that I point. see some terrific parents, uh, very affirming. Uh, they do a great job. I see others who struggle. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the younger you are, the more, the less weird and threatening this, this feels. It just kind of feels like, yeah, you know, it's part of the landscape and so forth. I mean, thinking about how we are, you know, we're, you know, the class of 64 and 69, you know, kind of those powerhouse 50 year plus classes that are, very much a, a seemingly, from what I can tell, a factor in, in the Amherst alumni culture. You know, um, yeah, it's it's a habit, um, so forth. So I mean, this my transition has been. And there's not a lot of people who say I look my age, uh, and part of that is genetics, but part of it is you know how I feel. I mean, I feel very alive and rejuvenated. It's true I got three high blood pressure meds, but I'm just not going to think about that. <laughs> you know, I, and uh, so I do think that, you know, I had children late, that helped. I was running around with chasing children when I was, you know, 60. And uh, so stuff like that mattered. Um, but everybody has their own arc of life development. Um, I don't know whether they teach a life development class uh, in the college. Maybe they ought to think about it. It's, it's something that I had in, in, in my graduate program, and I do think it's, it's kind of interesting. Anyone else? You. i got to make you wait, Harvey. So you mentioned earlier that you have the perspective of being male and female, and the female is a little bit more marginalized. Have you, could you expand on any feelings if you've had any 
do you feel any more marginalized than you did as a male? Yeah, people ask me that, and um, I think very little. In fact, a, a couple of things happened to me, and someone said, oh, that's because you're now a woman. I go, oh, okay, I didn't really, a couple of things. I'm white, oh boy, that's just so much more important. Uh, and I, I made that point, I wanna emphasize that, being white, and then I'm professional class, uh, I'm financially secure. I mean, you know, Medicare does not pay for breast enhancement. So I just wrote a check, you know, it's like, what the hell? It's, you know, cheaper than a trip to Disney World and lots more fun. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that helps, I'm self-employed. Uh, for a lot of people being coming out at work, although it's, it usually goes very, very well coming out at work. I don't see a lot of, I don't hear of a lot of people, I'm sure there are places, I mean, God, there's places where you're pregnant and you know, you're know you treated horribly, so I can imagine coming out as trans probably isn't well received. But uh, I'm in Connecticut, we're a blue state, uh, we like to say all good laws, no bad laws. Uh, the culture is for the most part pretty, Pretty affirming. I mean, there's, you know, there's always, even when people have a problem with it, they have a problem with it in kind of the New England way, which is, you know, a more measured <laughs> sort, of, sort of response. Uh, and Harvey, you had more? Well, I don't, I'm not trying to be difficult, Michelle. I want you to be difficult, if, Harvey. If, You're if, if, <laughs> if you can't test for it, how do you know that chemistry is different? Well, well they're, they're, they, can, they're, they are able, they're doing brain studies, so they can do brain studies, and I think that's, that's where you will get your best biological data. I mean, I don't know, we have all, my class has all these incredible biological science people, but for the last maybe 20, 25 years, the brain imaging is just like explosive, so the types of things that are being learned, uh, and we're just scratching the surface, the brain is insanely complex, and I hope it stays that way because I'm not sure I want to be reduced to just a bunch of neurotransmitters. Uh, I'd like to kind of partner with my neurotransmitters and a, a joint enterprise. Uh, <laughs> but that I think is where the knowledge will come uh, because in the, you know, in the trauma field, this is where brain imaging is doing tremendous, tremendous work in terms of nailing down seemingly subjective experiences. You know, seeing, you know, there's the book by Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score. It's really, a, it's a dense book, but uh, if you wanna sort of learn about both trauma and how brain imaging has, is moving our, our frontiers ahead, that's a really great place to start. And I've heard that Amherst alumni are very literate. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, totally. Um, why don't you, yeah, well, um, I have an email address. I'm trying to think what's the most efficient way. You know, if you were to go onto the college, the alumni directory and just look for Michelle Allison, you'll see an email address. Do you have a website? I do, perfect, yeah, I have two websites. I have michelleallisonlmft.com and all you have to do is just go, Michelle Allison, therapist, Connecticut, or even Michelle Allison in general will get you there, but Michelle Allison, LMFT, or Michelle Allison, therapist, uh, and you'll see my professional website uh, and uh, all my contact information there. And I'll plug for Wood Turned Art. If you go Michelle Allison, Wood Art, Wood Turned Art, you'll see great eyeball kicks. Um, so I'm all over the internet, you know, with. They will, I will put them on my website, but not, this, not tomorrow, but yeah, I'll, yeah, give me a week or so and I'll put them on. And you can just, you know, download them from there. You know, I'm not sure that your email address is on the, available to everybody, maybe just your classmates. Might be good. If you can give it, that would be great. All right, so uh, my, my personal email is mallison. You know, it's, you know, 1942, it's just so much shorter than the professional one, at gmail.com. Yeah, you're right, I don't know how that system works. I'm so unup to date about alumni stuff. Yeah, but just Google me and all, my email is there uh, and I'll put them on the website. 
because I actually think that'd be a, you know, that'd be make my website actually interesting, maybe. Because <laughs> there's no, there's, yes, ma'am. What are some like more impactful ways that uh, cisgender people can help to like support um, the trans community? Well, uh, most universities uh, um, offer ally training. And uh, if there's a university near you, if you sort of check out their LBGTQ entity, like at UConn, it's the Rainbow Center, but you know, every place has one. They will typically be giving ally trainings. Uh, and those, I think, would be a, a useful place to start. Um, and uh, in terms of, I mean, if you want to do some reading, um, you know, there's a, a book by Susan Stryker. Actually, maybe I'll put, to, what I'll do is, as part of the website, I'll put together my reading list, uh, my web links, and, they'll, and, then, and then you can browse through some of that. But I'd say an ally training. And if uh, there's a couple of ally books, I think if you find a local uh, heart, uh, a local P flag chapter, uh, that's a big ally resource. That's for you know all the allies. They do a lot of have literature, and if you're near any kind of real city, you can go to a meeting and and meet you know genuine trans people and their families. And there's usually have a like ours in Hartford has a lending library. And there's you know a lot of stuff available, so uh, you should be able to do fine. Anyone else? Oh boy, this is so much fun. <laughs>